Thank you. Um, right, so yeah, this is the science art lunch session. The aim of the session is to kind of have an informal environment where we can exchange ideas on how we can use art and use it to communicate science more effectively, um, try to be creative as possible, and also make it also make science more accessible to different audiences. Um, just going to say a few words before we um, start with our first speaker. Um, so at the start, um, there are some discussion points for you to think about. Um, we'll come back to these at the end if we have time. Um, but these are the sort of questions that I want the community together to think about. And then we can discuss um, outcomes and ideas uh, towards the end. Uh, we do have an art gallery that will be up tomorrow in the gallery. Um, later today, I will be putting up our artwork that we had submissions um, from the community from. Um, this will be up where the posters are um, and also online on our website. So do check those out. Um, and most importantly, this is an informal environment. We're not trying to be too formal. Um, so do enjoy yourselves and enjoy your lunch if you brought it with you. So without further ado, uh, we'll start off with our first speaker, which is Dr. Nicholas Bond, uh, who will be talking to us about the tactile universe. OK, can everyone hear me OK? Fantastic. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, so. Today I'll be talking to you about the Tactile Universe project, which is an outreach and public engagement project that we run at the University of Portsmouth. Um, it is mostly outreach and public engagement, but I hope by the end of this talk we might be able to argue that maybe by accident we've managed to do some, uh, some science art along the way. Um, as well, I, so I, I'm blind, I can't see my uh, this screen or that screen. If I start talking about stuff that clearly isn't on any of my slides, can someone yell out? Because I've probably uh, gotten myself out of sync. Okay, so just for anybody who's not familiar with the Tactile Universe project, um, so it's a public engagement project that we started back in 2016 with the aim of creating tactile representations of real astronomy data that we could use to engage the blind and vision impaired public, and make it easier for them to, to learn about astronomy and feel like they're a part of, of, of the astronomy community. Okay. And I missed my statement. Um, this is sort of the statement that underpins almost everything um, th that I'm going to be talking about. It's that when we think about astronomy, we usually think about really, really visual things. And that's the same for science art as well. A lot of science art is really, really visual. Because astronomy is so visual, because of the language that we use to talk about astronomy, because of the kinds of research we do, the way we plot things, all that stuff is super visual. It actually means a lot of blind and vision impaired people can feel uh, kind of locked out of the subject almost because they don't have uh, accessible ways of, of actually learning about the subject or engaging with the subject. Okay, so I always like to throw up a picture like this. Um, so this is a really, really detailed image of Messier 51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Um, you can see just looking at that, that there's a horrendous amount of detail. Um, you can see feathering in the spiral arms. You can see there's lots of different colors going on where there are different stellar populations. You can see everything sort of spiraling in towards that central bulge. There's just a lot of detail. And you might be wondering how on earth do we communicate this uh, in an easy way uh, to somebody who, for example, can't see this image. So we came up with a really simple solution. So we take uh, just a regular telescope image like the one on the left, and we create a 3D surface that basically maps the brightness of that image. So where the pixels are white or the brightest will be the highest tactile features. Where the pixels are the darkest or the blackest will be the lowest point in that model or usually the background. And then all of those colors of gray sort of scale in between. And so what we end up with is a surface that you can run your hands, run your fingertips across, and you get exactly the same information that you would if you were to look at that image with your eyes. You can feel those shapes, you can feel the changes in brightness that define that image. And when we, uh, so we obviously make these digitally and then we uh, produce them by 3D printing them. In the process of developing these, we did a lot of work with the blind and vision impaired community to make sure that the models were actually going to work for them. And we made a number of improvements to make sure that they would be accessible. Um, you'll notice the image on the right hand side is actually the back of one of our models. And what we've done is we've put a mirrored version of the image that we use to make that model uh, on the back side. So people with some vision or perfectly good vision 
can look at that image and they can feel the corresponding tactile features on the other side. And so that's just a way of making this multimodal uh, because it didn't make sense for us to make these just tactile because that would have been locking out a whole lot of people uh, from being able to use these effectively. The other thing you'll notice on the left-hand side on the front, uh, we actually have a border, a raised edge around the image itself. That's actually sort of like a measuring stick. So that border is the same height as the brightest feature in the image. And so if you bridge your hand between that and any part of the model, you can work out how bright that part of the model is. So by working with the blind and vision impaired community, we were able to make sure that these images were gonna be uh, really usable, really, really versatile and accessible. Okay. Normally when we take these into classrooms, we start off by talking about the night sky. So we have a tactile uh, image of Orion. We talk about the Milky Way uh, by using our tactile version of the edge on uh, sort of disc of the Milky Way as seen by uh, things like Gaia, that, that beautiful panoramic view. We also get students to build their own version of a, ta of a, of a spiral galaxy using a CD and some Play-Doh. And then we step on to talk about other galaxies. And we have all of these different tactile models that we can talk about. All of them have very different features, very different uh, properties. They're all very different kinds of galaxies. And so we can use these to talk about how galaxies change in shape. And so we can sort of discuss the, the galaxies research that we do. And just looking at these, I hope you're getting a sense of, of just how beautiful these are. Um, they are really, really beautiful models. Um, the images they're based on are quite beautiful as well. But feeling these as well is quite an experience. So obviously we usually 3D print these, but we've also played around with a couple of other different production methods. And each of these carries with it its own sort of tactile sense, I guess. So the 3D printed models are obviously made of plastic. They're very cool to the touch, very smooth. They can get quite sharp though. So when we have things like foreground stars, uh, you have to be a little careful that you don't cut your finger on that, for example. Um, a few years ago, we also produced these models by creating uh, silicon molds and pouring liquid resin into those um, to basically create these same models. We we're also able to embed our images inside the models when we made them this way. Um, so the resin ends up being a lot lower resolution. You don't get as much defined detail, but again, it's this beautiful glassy sort of smooth surface that you can touch. And these are also really beautiful to look at because you have that embedded image inside the, uh, the models. And last but not least, we've also played around with milling. So basically using a big industrial milling machine to make these models out of wood. Um, again, I mean, you've all picked up something made of wood before, you know how lovely wood is to feel. Um, so that's just another way that you can sort of access these models. We've also had some experience scaling this up. So the models that we normally work with are around about the size of a postcard. They're 112 millimeters by 112 millimeters, so not very big. That makes them easy to pick up and handle in two hands. Uh, you can set them on a tabletop really easily. It just makes them that little bit more usable. We did do some work with um, a museum in Newcastle though to make a giant uh, version of the Gaia uh, Milky Way mosaic image. And you can see a picture of that there. They actually had to 3D print this in four segments. It's almost two meters by a half meter in size. So it's really, really massive. Um, one thing with this though, because we made the size bigger, we also had to think about how detailed we wanted this image to be, because the bigger you make something, the more difficult it is to track the tactile features and the overall shape just using your fingertips. So we actually reduced the resolution of the tactile features and made them slightly higher, so easier to feel. And so that sort of scaled as we increased the size of the model. But there are definitely applications for this type of stuff to uh, museum exhibits like this. And I'm not gonna talk about this next bit too much because I'll be stepping on Chris Harrison's toes. Uh, but uh, back in 2018 or 2019, uh, we actually came to Warwick to do a show for the British Science Festival. You can see here that we used our tactile universe code to create images of a whole lot of different uh, astronomical images, everything from the cosmic microwave background to large scale structure to the surface of the sun. And we combine these with uh, audio elements, so sonifications of astronomical phenomena um, to basically, uh, again, introduce another mode, make sure that people weren't just relying on their sense of touch, that they could also listen to things while they were feeling these models. And in this case, we actually got the audience to put blindfolds on uh, just so that they could be completely isolated from their vision to do this. Okay, so I may have run under time, I'm actually really not sure, um, but I will uh, finish just after this slide so that uh, the other speakers can have a chance to talk. Um, 
If you've liked anything that you've seen today, um, one of the really important parts of our project is that we wanted to make everything we've developed free for anybody to access. So if you access our website, you can download the models that we've already made and you can 3D print those or mill them or produce them with whatever method you want to. We've also made freely avail available the software plugin that we use to make our images. And you can basically feed any black and white image through that and you'll get a tactile image at the other end that you can then 3D print. Um, so if anybody's interested in using the resources for anything, and please do let us know if you do, um, you can find us at www.tactileuniverse.org. Um, there's links to all of our materials. Um, if you want to deliver any of this stuff in classrooms, we also have our lesson plans and things like that. But yeah, we really want everybody to start thinking about how you can use tactile graphics to make what you're doing more accessible, um, but also to give you the tools to do that easily if that's something you want to do. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. That was excellent. Um, does anyone have any questions uh, about that? <laughs> um, we have like two minutes for questions. Um, yeah, I've got a comment actually, because I've used this uh, plugin. Um, it's very intuitive if you're familiar with Blender and you can get a 3D model up and running for any black and white image, as Nick said, fairly quickly. So I do recommend checking it out. Um, there's a GitHub repository for this. There is. Uh, yeah, so I think if you go into a tactile universe website, it's all there for you to check out. Cool. Um, I do have a question. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, the plastic from 3D printers. Mm. Um, what would the resolution be like if you used a resin printer, for example, if they can get finer structures? Yeah, so resin printers can do much higher resolution. Um, the issue with upping the resolution too much beyond what we've already got it at is your fingertip isn't actually capable of feeling right. the difference. So our resolution for the models sits at around about uh, what is it again? Two or three polygons per millimeter. Right. Um, so you've literally got yeah two or three little bumps sort of per millimeter. So it's around about the same size as Braille. Um, but yeah, you can make things finer than that, more detailed. But your fingertips don't necessarily feel the difference. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Does anybody else have questions? Uh, we got a question over there. Um, you <laughs> might need. We don't have a mic, so you might need to shout. Yeah, so there's actually an astronomer from, I think, Imperial College um, who printed a sort of golf ball sized version of the cosmic microwave background um, that was quite lumpy and bumpy. Um, both projection and sort of spherical object, I guess, have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, I, I found it a little bit more difficult to interpret the sphere at first. Um, but I think the, the, the thing that communicated really nicely was that the, the cells sort of of, of different temperature were roughly the same size uniformly across the surface. And yeah, I think when you do tactile images like this, you've got to sort of focus in on the thing that you're trying to communicate and make sure that's front and center. And I think that was sort of the science result that popped out to me um, when I was feeling that sort of golf ball sized thing. Um, uh, we've got one question here and one question here. So, John. Uh, what's your favorite object uh, in uh, so it's it's Messier 51 for me. Um, it's just such a beautiful example of a, a face on Spiral Galaxy. It's a merger as well. So it's got its little companion off to the side, uh, gradually having all the materials stripped away. Um, I just think it's a really beautiful object, but I also didn't really appreciate it properly until I felt the first um, 3D printed model that we made of it. Um, that really helped me understand just the shape and the structure of that so much better than I, I'd ever been able to. So. Uh, yeah. Um, 
so in, in a technical sense, um, so, the, so the question was, um, can we use different textures or different materials to highlight different features in the images? Um, and so, yeah, we, we can do that. You need a slightly fancier 3D printer than what we have access to. Um, again, we've had a group uh, take our, some of our M51 models and they actually printed the models with a squishy background and then they had the harder plastic for the actual uh, light, I guess, of the galaxy image itself. So it is definitely something you can do. Um, yeah, it takes a little bit more, a little bit slightly fancier 3D printer than what we have access to. But yeah, I, I think that is actually a really good idea. Okay. Um, I think we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, but can we thank Nathan? Yeah. Uh, and our next speaker is Dr. Chris Harrison from Newcastle University, and we'll be talking about the audio universe. Oh, thanks very much. So we're moving from the tactile universe to the audio universe. And like Nick, you know, I've not really thought about this too much in the artistic side, but it was good to be asked to do this talk to think about how we thought about this in an artistic sense, a musical sense, to put this project together. Some of you may have been in the a diversity session yesterday when I talked a little bit about this, but I'm going to talk a little bit more, uh, like I said, from the artistic side. So this is a project that's um, called Audio Universe, and we're turning the universe into sound for three primary reasons. One is just like Nick's project about accessibility and inclusion, thinking about representing the universe in different ways. The other is from a purely public engagement point of view to make science more immersive and engaging for all audiences. And finally, which I won't talk about today, is also thinking about the, the research side, how can we explore our data with sound rather than the traditional visuals. I'm gonna focus this talk on our flagship project to date, which is called Audio Universe Tour of the Solar System. This is a show that we released last year. And actually the, the show that Nick pointed out to you that we did in Warwick back in 2019 was a pilot to this. So this um, is a, show all about the solar system and the kind of underlying goal is to create an immersive and enjoyable experience that's educational that can be enjoyed irrespective of the level of the vision of the audience so we represent everything through sound as well as with visuals the primary target audience of the show is school pupils aged 7 to 12 as well as their families but we hope everybody enjoys it and as i mentioned the method is to represent everything with sound as well as with visuals and it's been released for planetariums with a 5.1 surround sound system, as well as you can watch it on YouTube or whatever with the stereo speaker system. It's all free to be used by any planetariums. We've got it in three languages so far, all there for you to use as you wish. Now, to put a project together like this, you really need a multi-skilled team. So I'm throwing up some of the key players here. On the top left, I'm showing a picture of James Trayford. He's at Portsmouth University. He was sort of the, the brains behind the coding. How do we turn data into sound and, and do the sound manipulation. Bottom left, Nick Bond, we've just seen his expertise in both his outreach experience with this audience and also his own personal experience was crucial. Then we have Lee Harrison. He's the key artistic part of this. I'll focus on his contributions in terms of being musical director and composer. He's me at the back. Then we have Amrit Singh, who is a blind school pupil. He was a chief consultant and really gave us important feedback as we went through the process. Very good at telling us what was rubbish. And then we went away and, and made it better, we hope. And then finally, Rachel Lambert, who's a specialist teacher of vision impaired children. And as well as being a key consultant, she provided the voice of the captain in the show. And actually Nick provides the voice of himself in the show. So thinking about this from an artistic planning point of view, there were sort of two main elements. There was sort of the storytelling element, and we did hire a, um, a creative writer as well as part of this process. And the story is we, the audience entered the spacecraft special spacecraft fitted with a sonification machine. So this is a machine that turns any light it receives into sound. So they get a little introduction to that machine and then the audience have taken on this tour around the solar system. They visit the, the very large telescope and then various objects around, you know, the planets, the sun, etc. before flying back to home. So that's sort of the storytelling side of it. And we have our vision impaired astronomer tour guide uh, with Nick Bond. But then thinking about the sound and the music side, we didn't want just to string together some random sounds that didn't really work as a whole. So we really took a long time thinking about 
how the sound works as a musical composition. So the whole show itself works musically, as well as trying to communicate these messages. So we really spent a long time thinking about the best way to choose the sounds to represent what we were trying to represent. And as I was mentioning, we wanted the whole thing to work coherently as a musical composition. I'm not a composer, by the way, I'm speaking on behalf of the musical director and composer who's on a nice cruise in Canada uh, right now. So the way we approach the musical side is we, we thought about the sun. You know, the sun is the center of the solar system. The sun holds the whole solar system together. And the sun appears several times in our show because it's all about the solar system. So just like the sun holds the solar system together, musically, we wanted the sound of the sun to hold the music together. And some of you may be familiar with the term pedal point. So this is like a low note that kind of holds all the rest of the music together. So we created a sound where the sun represent, uh, acted as a musical pedal point for the whole show. So we used a, a B flat tone as the sort of primary sound for the sun, but then we added on top of that some synthetic sounds, the plier sounds to create this idea of burning thing that's very hot. And then various points, we manipulated this sound. So if we're far away from the sun, we've changed it a bit. When the sun moves across the sky, we kind of track it across the sky in various ways to take this basic note and tone and then and manipulate it to give the different views of the sun. So let's see if we play it. You need a subwoofer really for this because it's got a lot of bass. So let's see what happens. So that's our underpinning notes representing the sun throughout the whole show. And then thinking about the planets, we wanted to represent the planets with sound. And again, we wanted this to work musically, but also communicate a message. So we tried to find this right compromise between representing the properties of the planets with a sound, but also something that was musically pleasing. So we, at the basic level, the smallest planets are represented by higher pitches and the lowest planet, uh, the most massive planets are represented by the lowest pitches. And overall, it builds up this musical chord. I'm showing the, the, the music on the screen, and it's a mixture between a B flat minor and a G flat major seventh chord, if that means anything to you. And then that allowed the composer to musically manipulate those chords for the, for the musical soundtrack. And it works, sounds nice with that sun underneath when you add these notes on top. And then thinking about what kind of sound should the sound sound like, we started with this sort of spacey synthetic sound thing. Oh, you know, it's space, it's just on spacey. But when we played this to our sort of people who were giving us feedback, they said, no, this doesn't work. I can't distinguish these sounds. These sounds don't mean anything to me. And in the end, the feedback was use real musical instruments because those are sounds that are familiar to me. I can assign characteristics of those sounds. And that's what we converged on in the end. And using brass instruments, the raspy sounds of brass instruments for the giant gasp, giant planets, and the more pure tones of woodwind instruments for the rocky planets to kind of reflect the character of the planets through these sounds. So I'm gonna play a clip now from the show where we hear the sun first, and then one by one, we're gonna introduce the planets and we've manipulated those sounds to give the idea of them going around the sun. Obviously we've sped up time considerably. We're not gonna sit here for years. Starting with the sun. Adding mercury one orbit in just 88 Earth days. Next, boiling hot Venus. Our home, the Earth, 365 days for one orbit. Mars, the red planet. Giant Jupiter. Next, ringed Saturn. Adding the side spinning Uranus. And finally, freezing cold Neptune. Fading out now. 
Okay, and if you listen to that either with headphones on or in a surround sound speaker system, you really get the sense of those planets going around your head. Then moving on to the stars, we wanted the stars to give that sense through sound of the stars appearing in the night sky, that beautiful thing that we can appreciate visually. So for this, we took real data of the stars above the Very Large Telescope in Chile, and we turned that data into sound. We used the color to represent, uh, pitch was representing color. So higher notes represented bluer stars and lower notes represented redder stars. We used a glockenspiel sound to kind of give this sort of twinkle impression. And yeah, we mapped these onto musical notes. And the, the notes we chose, again, we didn't want to tie it directly to the data because that sound awful. So we chose notes that were both musically linked to the planet sequence that we heard. So it works musically that way and don't create too much dissonance. So we, for those of you familiar with the term, we use pretty much a pentatonic scale, which doesn't create too much dissonance when you hear these notes at the same time. And again, we place these sounds spatially. So if you're in the surround sound, if, if a star appears over there, you hear it to this side. And if it appears over there, you hear it to that side. I'll quickly show up the data version of this plot, because one thing, I, this is the data of the stars. It's color versus magnitude. And as time goes through the sequence, the brighter stars appear first and the fainter stars appear later, just like the stars appearing in the night sky. And then we've grouped the colors into five bins of color, uh, the stars into five bins of color, and then map this onto the scale. So let's take a listen to that. Nope, we're gonna have to play that one. Okay, now the last thing I'll talk about is then the composer took these musical ideas that were based around the science, you know, loosely based around the science, and then used these musical motifs that you've heard from the planet sequence and the star sequence and whatever, to then create a musical composition that works in its own right. So it's about a four minute piece of music, which works uh, on its own, but that also forms the basis of musical soundtrack of the whole show. And that's called A Sonic Journey by Lee Harrison. You can either, you know, if you want to listen to it, it's leeharrison.co.uk or on our website, audiouniverse.com. Uh, I've put .com, but it's .org, sorry. Uh, audiouniverse.org is our website. And I'll just play a few seconds of that uh, before I finish. Okay, so that, those of you keen here, those notes you heard were the same notes that were used for the plants. So a quick shout out to the people who've helped us, a lot of external partners who've helped us, Views Group, Great North Museum, Newcastle Vision Support and the Sunny Sound Academy. We've had funding from the Royal Astronomical Society as well as SDFC. With that, I finish. Thank you very much.
whatever. Um, that was an excellent talk on, honestly, I don't know much about music, but this was very insightful to see how science can be represented in this way. So do we have any questions from the audience? One there? Yeah, that's lovely. Um, I was wondering if you've been able to think about using, I mean, I'm a plasma physicist, okay, so mm -hmm. one of the things, the sounds that we listen to are from plasma waves, yeah. and they can be converted into sound waves, and so you can hear the sort of edge of the solar system, you can hear the Jupiter's aurora, so I wonder if you've had a chance to or engage in any of that at all. So personally, I haven't done um, done that, but there are you know there are many different ways we can do it. We have a code called Strauss, which you can take any data set and turn into sound in many different ways. And there are other codes out there. So if you go, again, if you go to our website, alluniverse.org, there are some links to those codes. And if you're interested, you could grab your data, throw it through these things, and produce produce the sound. But if you want to contact me, and we can discuss the best way to do that, I'll be very happy to. Oh, um, uh, you can use it in a blow-up planetarium or, or a fixed dome planetarium, depends on you know what you have. Oh, and um, did you ever think about like looking outside of the solar system? Yeah, so I'd love to make another show, uh, <laughs> um, particularly about black holes or something, but I'm trying to find the resources and the time <laughs> to do it. So yes, absolutely. My got big ideas of representing extra galactic things with sound. But yeah, it's just finding the time and the resources to do it. Anyone wants to fund it, I'll be very happy. Thanks very much for the talk, Chris. It's super interesting. Um, I was wondering if, in the same way when Nick was talking about uh, a sort of um, resolution limit in terms of uh, the difference between two points with the tactile stuff, mm. you can feel the difference if they're too close together. Was there anything that you guys ran into audially if you know, like two notes were played without enough time between them so you would just hear them at the same or if the pitch was too similar you would be able to tell the difference? Is that something that you guys had to figure out as well or is that not? Yeah, so th this is something that we worry about quite a lot and I said there's one, one thing we're doing is looking about analysing data with sound or at least investigating data with sound and for that you re actually sound gives you quite a lot of resolution because our pitch resolution is really good. So you can kind of use that to your advantage. And, but for that, you worry more about those things and it not sounding good necessarily, unless it's really unpleasant. For this, our main concern was it sounded good and it was a pleasurable experience overall, but it still loosely communicated the messages. And that's what we learned quite quickly. And I was having a fight with the composer. I'm like, oh, it needs to be scientific. It needs to be scientific. And he was like, no, it needs to sound beautiful. <laughs> and that was the main conversation about finding the right balance there for, for this application. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's not really a question. It's a sonification from the Chandra's uh, X ray telescope that yeah. published in May. Um, it, it really sounds fabulous. It's black hole sonification with remix, black hole at the center of the Perseus galaxy cluster. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I, I know the people who, who are making those. We're quite a small community, and um, there's a lot of things online. And we, we just published a, a review article in Nature Astronomy where we talk about a lot of these projects. We link quite a lot on our website. So I explore you to not just us, you know, go and see what everyone's doing. And Space Telescope and um, NASA have done some great things. Thanks very much. Okay, so our next speaker is going to be presenting virtually. So I'm going to stop sharing. Hello. Uh, hi, Rob. Just give me one second to set up. Yeah, all right. There we go. Let me know when to share my screen. Uh, okay. Okay, you're good to share. All right. All right. All right. Uh, yeah, just full screen if I'm done. Okay, cool. All right, thank you very much. Uh, 
I'm not sure I can promise the rolling soundscapes of the last talk. It was fascinating. So I live at Appleby for the University of Manchester. And I would talk to you about a project called Tactile Collider, which is an outreach project, again, for the visually impaired. But we did a lot of interesting things along the way, including feeling Higgs bosons and also getting lots of people in rooms pretending to be protons. And I'll tell you about the art aspects of that um, as we go through. So just uh, to start with the science, uh, ten, it's now 10 years since we discovered the Higgs boson, the Large Hadron Collider. So I, I'm an accelerator physicist and I work on the Large Hadron Collider. We built the LHC and we discovered this particle and this particle is related to giving mass to all particles in the universe. This is really, really exciting. And it was a, while it's not the only bit of science going on, it's certainly uh, it's a high profile bit of science. And LHC is, is one of the biggest experiments we've ever constructed on this planet. And they announced the discovery of the Higgs boson, two experiments, on the 4th of July, 2012. And this is the, the cover of the uh, uh, physics letters that showed the discovery. We had lots and lots of, images like this one. So this is a, this is a real event uh, from CMS, which is one of the two, so, sorry, Atlas, uh, uh, it was 10 years ago, uh, 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 one of the two experiments. And this is when we make a Higgs boson right in the middle there. I can't point, but you see where all those little orange lines are right in the middle, uh, where we create a Higgs boson. A Higgs boson is a particle. It likes to decay pretty much straight away into two particles called Z particles, which then decay into particles called muons, which are basically just heavy electrons. So you see there's four red lines. They're the four lines of the muons, and because the muons are there, we know the Higgs boson was there. So good, and now you understand how mass works in our universe, which is pretty exciting. One of the problems, of course, is we want to engage everybody possibly can with this exciting bit of science. And it's a very inherently visual method of communication. I gave lots of talks, um, all physicists did around this time who are linked to the, uh, the LHC. And we use lots of pictures like the one we're looking at now. But of course, if you're visually impaired, uh, um, you start to lose some of the information from this. So already you see, you lose some of the image, a little bit more, a little bit more until eventually you lose the meaning entirely. So it's really important that we do our communication in not in more than just visual methods. And we do and we do this for many reasons. We do this not only to engage as many audiences as we possibly can in the science, which is uh, everyone has a right to be involved. We also want to recruit into science with a diverse portfolio of people as possible. So we can't get ourselves too used to communicating in purely visual ways. But also it makes all our communication better by relying less on visual tools and developing other methods of, of communicating the things that we're trying to say. So I hope I've convinced you it's good to have a diverse range of communication tools to reach a diverse range of audiences with the science that we all do in modern science. So Tactile Collider is a project that we created about the same time actually as Tactile Universe. It's a bit hazy now, maybe 2016 or 17. And what we did was we want to take fundamental physics, the Large Hadron Collider, the Higgs boson, and, and re-express it in a way that would make it accessible to a, 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 a visually impaired audience. So we did this, we created a project, we did lots of analysis, I'll tell you a little bit about it, and then we've toured Europe with it, going to schools, going to music festivals, going to science festivals, and reaching tens of thousands of people with this message. And, and what I want to talk to you about today uh, is along the way, we've made a lot of fun stuff. Some of the stuff you've kind of already seen, actually, so it's quite nice to have that resonance. So the four things I'll tell you about are, we've sonified LHC data to make three-dimensional soundscapes. We've made tactile Higgs events where you could feel the Higgs boson, and in principle, even make measurements of the Higgs boson with your fingers. We built a powerful accelerator, a model of one that we take to schools. And also, I think my favorite bit, we did some drama and we worked with some um, embodied learning experts to get kids pretending to be protons. So I'll tell you all about them one by one. impaired students one-to-one -one interactions to teach them a little bit of science and also we published everything we did in this in this reference so before i get into the intro um, into the art things that we did i'll just tell you um, the project 
they tell you a tendency sometimes in physicists to think that we know all the answers uh, a priori. We really don't. So when we started to do this project, we didn't want a physicist's view of how we communicate science to the visually impaired audience. We wanted to talk to the audience itself. So we spent about 18 months engaging with the audience. We visited schools, uh, visually impaired and mainstream schools. We talked to consultants. We talked to kids. We talked to adults. We went on um, RNIB radio to talk to people. And the result of that was lots of training, lots of listening to the audiences to figure out what we should be doing. And that's, for us, one of the messages I give in my talks to my physicist colleagues is it's very, very important to do any kind of engagement to an um, underrepresented audience so we'd listen to the audience first and understand how they want to be communicated with and, and what dialogue they want to have. Uh, I think it's a very important point to get out of this project. So I'm not going to talk too much, because I don't have much time, about the actual tactile collider event or the model. Uh, we can dis discuss that, or I can send you information. But basically, it was a two-hour interactive event that we we brought to people. It had four phases where we taught the audience about particles, about magnets. We use magnets and accelerators to control and focus particle beams. We about acceleration and also about the Higgs boson. And you can see on the top right, I'll come back to it. You see, this is one of our events where we have this tactile. Uh, particle accelerator called Cassie. So we, we took Cassie to ev every event we went to, and you can feel how a particle accelerator actually feels, and also how it actually sounds. And that was uh, uh, and that was very very popular. We also along the way lots of other fun things. We did a lot of public engagement, uh, music festivals, and science festivals, and literature festivals, and we also did CPD. So we trained the teachers in how not only how to deliver our materials but also in the science, because one of the things we found the teachers didn't have access to was a physicist who could tell them what the Higgs boson actually was. And that was a very useful thing for people. So here is a, here's a picture of one of our events. This is, this is all pre-COVID. And the first thing I want to tell you about is if you look in the middle of that table, you see these, uh, these little gray rectangles. Now, that's our version of the tactile galaxies you just saw from Tactile Universe. And what we did was we took real events from the Large Hadron Collider and we 3D printed them. We 3D printed events where nothing interesting happened. We 3D printed events where something interesting happened. And then we 3D printed events where Higgs bosons were produced. Um, it's a rectangle because we have a cylindrical detector and it's like we unroll that detector like a piece of carpet and you get a rectangle. So what you can do is you can, you, with your fingertips, you can feel what our detector looks like when there's no Higgs boson. And then if you look very closely, you'll see there's two pillars, two towers on a Higgs boson event. And you can feel with your fingertips, they're actually the real signature in the Large Hadron Collider of two photons, two particles of light, where a Higgs decayed straight away to two photons. There is a, um, I would like to explore actually making measurements tactilely by we can take lots of different events in the LHC and you can actually do a counting exercise by classifying events with your fingertips and you can make measurements about quarks, about Higgs bosons, about photons. That'd be a nice thing to explore. And also you see on that table some headphones. So along the way, uh, we, we created a side project called Sonic Collider, where we took a whole load of data from the LHC. We took real physics events, so Higgs bosons, photons. We, we listened to the stored particle beam in the accelerator and we sonified that. And we also made some sonification of some beam acceleration data. We then created three, three soundscapes in 3D sound and decoded them onto a bi um, to binaural. So we could take this and you could hear quarks and uh, photons and pigs moving around your head and hearing the actual data from the machine. It's quite an interesting topic, sonification. You have to choose, are you gonna be aesthetic? Are you going to, or are you going to be scientifically accurate? That's an interesting trade-off uh, one has to make. If I was more organised, I would have uh, played for you on the soundscapes, but I don't have one to hand. But uh, we could, if you're interested, we could talk about it afterwards. Uh, we also built Cassie. So particle accelerators have unique have unique noises, unique smells, unique um, um, feel. So we, we it's hard to take people, students, and people from 
uh, schools and, uh, and festivals to the LHC, but you can take an accelerator to them. So this is this is our accelerator, we call it a CASI, and it, has, it contains magnets, it contains beam pipes, it contains accelerating cavities, just as the Large Hadron Collider does. So you can then, you can feel what the beam pipe feels like, you can smell what it feels like, you can hear what it feels like. This is the centerpiece of our events and linked all the four different topics that I talked about nicely into one event. So the fourth bit was my fun, <laughs> was the funnest bit. And this is actually probably gonna be our biggest follow-up project is gonna be the drama. So we, at one event we did, there was a there was a there was two girls there and um, one was visually impaired and her mum was a drama teacher. So we got talking and we got more talking. We had some ideas and then we figured out uh, doing drama or, or embodied learning, as it's called, uh, would be in a fun way to teach people about particle accelerators. So here you see one of our events. There's me on the front left there, uh, and you can see all these kids have <laughs> joined together and we're being a particle accelerator. We also had people create little little drama sections. They would, what happens when two protons collide? What happens when a Higgs boson does this? And kids would go away in little groups. They would create a little drama scene and then they would perform it to the rest of the group. This was by far the funnest part of everything that we did and something that people keep asking us all the time to go back and do more. So I think this is what we would like to do a bit more of in the future. We also, I'm not going to talk about the, uh, the evaluation, we did a whole evaluation of the whole project, the whole tour, uh, with an external evaluation company. Uh, I, won't, but I don't have the time to tell you about that, but I will tell you that one of the things that we found most interesting in this whole exercise was one of the things kids in schools most valued, especially if they had visual impairments or other disabilities, was scientists actual scientists coming in to talk to them they didn't actually they couldn't access scientists normally so it was that was one of the high spots for many people and that came very through through very strongly in the feedback um so that's it conclusion uh, tactile collider there's a lots of fun things we did lots of interesting side projects like 3d soundscapes like tactile higgs events like drama and also i should note that we've not yet managed to restart post covid but uh, we hope to do so uh, later this year. So thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you very much, Mark. That was excellent. It was nice to see the average part they've done. Um, before we end, are there any questions for Mark? No? Um, uh, I've got a quick question. Um, so regarding the drama project, so how did you go about like, creating the choreography for um, the sort of experiments that you were trying to visualize? I, I couldn't quite hear the question. Was it about the choreography of the drama? Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. So we worked with um, two, two drama teachers who were used to be choreographers. So we created a whole load of set pieces and pre-made games. We would get the audience going and moving. Actually it turned out to be quite useful to warm people up at the start of events. But then a big part of it was actually co-creating drama live with the groups of kids uh, based on the stuff that they'd learned that day. That only, not only made it fun, it made it physical, it reinforced the learning. So it was a mixture of working with drama teachers for pre-choreographed set pieces, but the, I think the most valuable actually was the co-creation on the fly with the groups of kids. Okay, brilliant. Um, I think we're going to end the session now, but before we do, Jake, do you want to share the final slide? Okay, yeah. Um, so now that the session is virtually over, um, please take a second to fill in the survey. But I hope that this has inspired everyone to hopefully think about how we can, as a community, um, use our research and... Oh, sorry, question? Very quick. On the local stuff, okay. Sorry. I'm local, so before you all disappear off, I don't know if this is working. No, um, I'm local, so before you all disappear off, I just want to mention, there's a ton of art around the campus, okay? You can go and look at it. I just want to mention two pieces which are really relevant to this. One is in the Ramphel building, and it's called Maps to the Stars. It's a huge work, okay? Uh, to get to it, you go out of here, you turn left, you keep walking, and you'll see a wonderful big white building on your left. 
brownfield building. The other one is in the foyer of the physics building on the ground floor. And it's one of mine, it's a 10 foot square work um, about the early universe, but there's a whole load of other context as well. So, but do look around all the art on campus. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just to add on to that, don't forget, we do have an art gallery that you can check out tomorrow. Um, but yeah, besides that, thank you very much for coming. I'd like to thank the team for having me put this together. Um, if you'd like to see more sessions like this, this is what my first attempt at creating something like this. Please do give your feedback and we'll try to improve. So thank you very much for coming.